This morning I want to just very briefly, so please if I go over it very quickly, don't think I'm being dismissive of these areas. But I'm going to assume that you know these things. Does that make sense? In other words, I'm going to go through them purely as revision, as people that know these concepts intimately and are practicing them. So, the first thing I want us to know that there's a, a book written by a man called James Montgomery Boyce. And he says the following, there are two ways to commit idolatry worship. Worship something other than the one true God. And the second one is worship the one true God in the wrong way. And here again, what I want to say is that when you are worshiping God, we want to right from the beginning mention is that there are specific things that God has asked of us. In other words, you cannot assume that he will be okay with something. And there are many examples where God indicated that he wasn't happy with the way that he was approached. A gentleman by the name of Ron Sylvia just tells you that here is worship in terms of Christendom general, especially within the denominations, is a shifting sand landscape. It always changes, it always adapts, it always, always tries to innovate. Let's just look very quickly. He moved, they grow, grew from 21 to 2,500 people in 10 years. And then he says the following. Worship style is as important as theology. The entire worship experience must be evaluated through the eyes of your target. When you confidently determine who your target is, who you're trying to reach, it makes the crafting, crafting a worship experience for that person a lot easier. Though some trial and error, you will learn what works and what does not work for your target group. Right here, you will see that the fashioning of the worship service is according to the needs of people. Be very aware, God does not operate that way. The theology within the Bible, especially around worship, is what God expects and how he regulates the relationship between him and us. And what that intimate spiritual connection with us, what that all entails. A man by the name of John MacArthur, he's a Baptist, and friends of mine have studied with him in the States. Um, he's really very conservative, but he makes the following, which I think it's a valuable comment. He makes a comment in scriptural worship. He says the following, we have a society filled with people who want what they want when they want it. They are into their own lifestyle, recreation, and entertainment. They want comfort, happiness, and success. And when churches appeal to those selfish needs, they only fuel fires that hinder true godliness. And what is very important is that it is recognized, especially within evangelicalism, that this is a dangerous, dangerous trend. Jesus himself says the following, um, many do not know what it means to worship and serve God, and they incorrectly associate emotionalism and spirituality. In other words, many times folk would say, I love a worship that is lively, a worship that is exciting, a worship that really engages me, that I could walk away highly motivated, highly emotionalized. Jesus makes a very simple statement, and he says, those who worship me must worship me in truth and spirit. What if we define good worship merely by what is pleasing and acceptable to us? And here I want us just very quickly and very briefly, please, Brendan, I want you just to bear with me. I am battling with my eyes, and I actually found that it worsened over the last couple of days. I'm going in for surgery on the 9th of May, so if you'd like to keep me in your prayers, that would be great. For, um, in verse 18 of chapter 3 in Philippians 18 and 19, he says, For as we have often told you before, and now see, say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. And here again, I want us to have the view that in terms of what God wants, he wants us to be focused on him. And what he requires from us. Romans 1.25 is another text I want to just reference very quickly. Where, where Paul writes, they exchanged the, the truth of God for a lie. 
They worshipped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised. In other words, our focus of our worship, and that is why for us it's a worship worship uh, workshop where we look and ask the question, in every role that we fulfilled, is it achieving the goals that God has for us? Many are encouraging churches to incorporate mood lighting, video, music, body movement, social media into the worship experience. When we are driven to, to provide memorable and enjoyable experiences, we'll find people they want brighter, faster, and more exciting experiences. In fact, there's a good friend of mine, and he's, a, he's an elder in a very big charismatic church around the near to us. And I asked Mark, I said, Mark, what are you doing? And he said to me, brother, that's what the people want. And I said, but what about what God wants, Mark? And he said to me, he says, you know, Derek, um, it is so hard. But listen to this. And, and I love Mark. He's really a wonderful man. He says, if we want to keep these people, we must keep them entertained and keep them captured. Can I just shock you? I had a long discussion with him, and there was another elder as well. And he turned around, and both of them said the following. They said, can I just say this to you? Because um, then they're aware of the churches of Christ. He said, we would rather have a handful of people that are dedicated in their worship than trying to entertain the masses. This comes from people that are practicing what sometimes we find in the churches find attractive. And brethren, we must be very, very careful of that. Um, <clears throat> find out what people want, give it to them, whatever that is. Do not offer what they do not want. Special music, gimmicks and attractions, the Hollywood, Disneyland, Las Vegas music industry becomes the model, not God and his word. And in fact, the entire objective of connecting people to, with God during worship, fueling the spiritual connection between them and God, is in fact missed. John MacArthur writes in his book called Ashamed of the Gospel, he says, Evangelicals everywhere are frantically seeking new techniques and new forms of entertainment to attract people, whether the method is biblical or not, scarcely seems to matter to the average church leader today. The question is, does it work? That is the test of legitimacy. And so raw pragmatism had become the driving force in which in much of the professing church. Um, and here again, we find things like spiritual dancing, uh, various kind of uh, concerts being held, opfurings and so on. And I'm not saying there might not be a good thing for children uh, to have a little concert for them at Sunday school, but when we are talking about corporate worship, when God's people gets together, that's very different. Worship is, proskuneo, Theo defines it, to kiss the hand toward one as a token of reverence. Among the Orientals, especially the Persians, they fall upon their knees, touch the ground with their forehead as an expression of profound reverence. In the New Testament, by kneeling or prostration or do homage or make obeisance. Uh, whether in order to express respect or to make supplication. It's also used of homage shown to men and being beings of superior rank. I met with a, a Persian lady a while ago. She's married to a very good friend of mine, computer scientist. And we were talking, and can I just say this to you? She turned around, she says, of all, listen very carefully to me, Two Persian ladies come from the same area, and they said, of all the churches we have ever been involved with, it is only the churches of Christ who honors the God that they worship. These come from people that we are trying to teach the gospel to. She says, everyone else, she says, the disrespect that they see is frightening. Now, these are people we're trying to reach for Christ. This is not to build big churches and have large numbers. We want folk to be in Christ and to get home. Even, can I just say this, now be very careful. We have to do what God's word says. Then also proskineo is to make obeisance, to do reverence from uh, 
means pros, which means toward, and then kumeo, which means to kiss, is the most frequent word rendered to worship. It's used in an act of homage, reverence. Reverence is focused on God. In other words, it is theocentric, which means that we focused on God rather than androcentric. In other words, on us as humans. We focus on him because he is the the, the, the source of our life is the object of our worship and we also as I said toward Christ and there you can look at those references yourself worship of the local church is, pra is pragmatism wise man's wisdom has always failed to please God read 1 Corinthians chapter 2 it's an incredible homage which where Paul writes and says it is impossible for people through humanistic means to reach God. He says that is why Christ came to this world. And so be aware that, that although there might be short comments, they are very pithy, but they are extremely weighted. We must ask, what does God want? What has he told us? And if we actually want to please him. That is the question on the table when it comes to worship. If we do what God commands, it will work and accomplish what he wants. Isaiah 55 is a passage I quickly want to reference as well because I want to get into some practical uh, things for us. <coughs> Isaiah 55 verse 8 through uh, 11. Um, he says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways, are your ways, my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow comes down from heaven, do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. And so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. And that is why we are focused on what God and he requires from us. Worship, when we study it, we compile all references to the subject, including direct statements, approved actions and necessary implications. If you have studied theology a little bit, you are familiar with these terms. I did not want to give an uh, academic definition of it, but just say to you, what we want to know is, what are those passages that refer, that command us to do, what was done, and then also what the implications of it is. In other words, that we are fully aware of what God wants. Remember, our source is the word of God. What are the general principles governing our worship? It must be done in truth and spirit. It must be for the right purpose. And that is obviously to serve God. It must be done decently and in order. And here again, I want to just speak to us, brethren, that in our preparation, in our presentation, in what we are doing toward God, I know many of us and myself, we are dressed casually. And I accept all of that. But when it comes to worshiping God, we need to do it differently. You know, you know, when you and I go for an interview with a company, we find out what their dress code is. And we accept that. I preached in a congregation many years ago, and I asked the brother, what is the dress code, an acceptable dress code here? Because I had a tie and a jacket and all that kind of stuff. And I accepted all of that. And I put it on, and he said to me, brother, um, uh, it's a town pretty much on the, on the beach. And he said, yeah, we actually don't mind. You can be more casual. And I don't think it was said in any offensive way. But what I'm saying is when you're in an environment where people do um, have a dress code, be aware of it if you are teaching or serving there. Respect who you are worshipping. It involves sacrifice. And also it involves us giving up of ourselves and saying, what is acceptable to God? How can we do it better? How can we give up? Let me just say the following. When you and I work in the secular world, and I come out of the secular world and work very, very hard in that secular world, you do not stop at anything to make sure that your objectives are meet, met. You will work right through the night if need be, if you've got a presentation the next morning. And so too with God. We give him our best. 
when we get together tomorrow to worship. We give him the very best that we know how to give because we know that we are worshiping and he's the object of our worship. He is the one that evaluates our heart. He knows that we are focusing and who we are serving. It's a holy people. It is his people. We are not talking to our pals. We are not trying to get a market share. We are drawing people toward God. John 4.24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The proper object is God. The proper attitude is the spiritual aspect. It is a deep interconnectedness and connection with God. The proper authority, we use God's truth. We only work from God's word, from nothing else. Psalms 95 verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down, let us kneel before the Lord who is our maker. Psalms 96 9, O worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness, tremble before him all the earth. And I need you to know the following, that if in any way you are confused about who you are dealing with, and that is maybe an area where you need to look at and work at. Know who you're dealing with. And I think sometimes that is something that we are confused about. Therefore, our worship is slapdash. Our worship is unprepared. Our, 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 our service to God is something that is just relevant. We think that it is our duty to evaluate how good the worship has been. Let me warn you. You are standing before a holy God and he knows what goes on in your heart. It's not your job to sit and evaluate whether a Josiah is doing a good job or where, um, whether uh, uh, um, Uncle Joshua is doing a good Lord's Supper. That is between him and God. That is between him and God and he will stand and fall or fall before God. But our job is to engage in that spiritual worship with him and tremble. Because we are in the presence of a holy God. Um, Leviticus chapter 10 verse 3. Be, By those who come near me I must be regarded as holy. And before all the people I must be glorified. Don't play games when you're busy with God. Be serious. Be committed. Isaiah 66 1 and 2. For all of those things my hands is made. All of those things exist says the Lord. But on this one will I look. On him who is poor and of contrite in spirit. And who trembles at my word. God honors your devotion and your, your, your attitude. Hebrews 12. Since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably. With reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. You will assume who you're dealing with. And you will be horrified to note that when you're dealing with a holy God, he is not your equal. He is the creator of this universe. And that comes with a responsibility to reverence him in the proper way. God only accepted worship was offered from the heart. Physical ordinances were until the time of the reformation. Know this, there's a clear cut in the covenant. The New Testament worship is more in keeping with the nature of God and relates more to the spiritual side of man. I'm busy studying the book of, not the book, as a context, and um, a book uh, in Hebrew, but it's, it's dealing with the concept in Genesis, which absolutely blew me away. Just the concept of God and what God was trying to achieve, literally, just between the husband and the wife in the beginning of his creation of this universe. The Hebrew is frighteningly detailed. And when you look at that through that Hebrew, you start to see what the New Testament was all about and start to see that the New Testament comes alive. The Old Testament there comes alive there. And everything in between was man's standing and falling, trying to please God. And also obviously going into carnality. But that's for another discussion. The Old Testament was carnal. They were fleshly. They were ordinances. Physical structure. The New Testament is to the spiritual side of man. It deals with a temple spiritual in Christians where Christ inhabits the body. The spirit inhabits us. Special priesthood, clothing for priests. That's what they had. 
All Christians are priests. That is why we do not wear special clothing, special garbs, and we don't have special titles we serve. Lamps, burning incense. We know from now that the prayers are the sweet incense. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 8. That goes up to God. And actually, when I read that many years ago, where the bowl of, of, of all the prayers of the saints are held under the throne of God. Brethren, it just gave me goose flesh. Um, instruments of music was held in the Old Testament. Melody is now made in the heart. And if you look carefully at the Greek, the instrument is the heart. It is the connectedness between you and I and God. There's a, um, a study that I'm also busy looking at called the vagus nerve. And I'm, I'm not going to say anything more about it, but they, when you look at the human body, the interconnectedness between the brain and the rest of the body is actually quite amazing. And I become scared when I look at this because the more you learn, the more God will hold you accountable. And so I'm encouraged by that because it stretches me into his, his domain. Feast days, we know there's those have passed. We now have the Lord's Supper, which we'll deal with briefly. We know there was animal and me meal sacrifices. Now we know that there are spiritual sacrifices. And so all of these things changed within our New Testament worship. Well, the Lord's Supper. Firstly, Acts chapter 20, verse 7. I'm going to assume that you know this stuff. Now, when we talk about preparation of the Lord's Supper, brethren, here's the key. I'm going to keep it very, very simple. The Lord's Supper is exceptionally well documented. Well, not the Lord's Supper per se, but the event when Jesus Christ changed Seder into, into the Lord's Supper. The significance of those cups were changed when Jesus said, this is the cup. And then he says, this bread is and so when you are preparing the Lord's Supper to, for tomorrow, you go and sit down and you read passages like 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 34. You go through Matthew, I think it's 26, where Jesus Christ institutes the Lord's Supper. You immerse yourself in the text and you start to connect with the event. When you prepare for the Lord's Supper, don't you dare do a sloppy job. Don't you dare talk about your friend's hobbies or about golf or about Star Wars or anything like that. I find it highly disrespectful and in fact I find it offensive. Now, if I as a human who've come to worship God find that offensive, how much more God? You see, Jesus Christ came, he left heaven for us. And hence there is a completely different view that we have of him. Our focus is on him. He is the focus of that event that took place and was in the mind of God. The struggle of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane is a huge event. The struggle of Jesus saying, Lord, there must be another way. There must be crying before God. Those events in your Lord's Supper preparation, go through them, consult Good commentaries where you can look at them, read, stretch yourself. Stretch yourself into the idea of who Jesus is and what the significance of it is. Go through the book of Hebrews. Look at when Jesus Christ is considered higher than the angels. When he is considered as the ultimate and the plea of the Hebrew writer saying, don't walk away from this despite the difficulties. Hear the plea, hear the cry that there's nothing above that. Hear the connection with God that Jesus Christ stepped in and held his hands open and pulled these two poles, pulled them together. Look how Jesus Christ brings wholeness to the hearts of humanity. Look at those things when you prepare for the Lord's Supper. I want to say the following to you. You cannot do a good Lord's Supper unless you pray. Continue. Don't you dare sit on a Saturday night and prepare your Lord's Supper. You start on a Monday. And you pray. And you ask God to prepare my heart, Lord. So that I can serve you. So that I can bring to the table a meal and present Jesus Christ to my family. 
so that when we walk away, we've got a renewed mind as to who Jesus is. You have got a holy task. You know, when we talk about Lord's Supper and structure, and I'm going to intermingle that, you probably have about five to seven minutes. Can I just say this to you? You can say a lot in five to seven minutes. You can really make it count. I've heard the most drawn out Lord's Suppers. That says nothing. And I've heard the most pithy Lord's Suppers. That literally got me saying, Oh, don't stop. Say more. Say more. And here's the key. If you are so full of your study that you literally say, Derek, I've got so much more to talk about. Let's talk and have you do a sermon. Does that make sense? Because if you can deepen our knowledge in terms of what you have studied, that is contributory to our knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Prayers are something, brethren, you cannot rock up and start to pray in five minutes flat. You cannot stop and sort of make it up as you go along. Acts chapter 4, verse 23 to 31. I want to just um, uh, read the following in verse 25. I'm, I'm literally going to try and, and scrunch this up. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant David, our father David. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel in the city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will have decided beforehand should happen. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant Jesus. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. In your preparation for your prayer on a Sunday morning, go through the book of Daniel. Watch how Daniel prayed. Look at Jesus, how he prayed, what he said. Garden of Gethsemane is a brilliant one. Luke 11 is a brilliant one. Look at the prayer of Nehemiah. Look at Moses' prayers. Look at all these prayers, are these people connected with God? Daniel chapter 10 for me is an incredible example. Daniel chap from chapter 1 through to chapter 5 is an incredible one. These weren't light prayers. They were anchored in the word of God and the histrionic relationship that they had with God through history. It is something far deeper. It is something far deeper than saying, Lord God and guidance directs us. Lord, please will you, we pray for the sick, for the lame and the ill. Don't, don't come with that. Come with deeper stuff. Come with deeper stuff that is experienced in your prayer room at home. You can detect very quickly when a man that's praying before the assembly of God is a praying person. You can detect it very quickly. Now if I can see it, how much more God? Your worship is not directed to please me. Your, direct, your worship is directed toward pleasing God. And therefore it is a serious matter. In fact, I want to touch on very quickly a passage, 1 Timothy, where Paul says men everywhere must hold up holy hands. God has never commanded us to do this when we pray. It is the misunderstanding of that text. The language of that time will tell you that every person that heard that would understand that it is in the holiness of that person without disputing. In other words, he can comfortably worship God knowing that he's not at odds with any brother, that he is one that is in unity. In fact, if he has, he sorts that stuff out first and then comes and prays before God. It is a holy, holy event. It is something far greater. 
Giving, we might need to deal with at another time. Singing, Lance will deal with us, uh, deal with that for us a little later. And we will talk about the importance of singing within worship. Brethren, your singing preparation. You don't walk in here and start giving Charles grief at the back there saying, uh, what song is good for this? What song is that? You prepare your heart so that when you do present and lead the church in worship, that's not a time for you to come and get a hold of a diatribe and start telling stories. You get up here and you worship God. You lead the congregation in worship. Preaching and teaching, the brethren will deal with that far more adequately than I can possibly do. Men that I love and respect very dearly will do that for us. Mervyn, unfortunately, couldn't make it. Um, um, Wilmot will be standing in for him. Wonderful young man, and you will see he's very talented. Preaching and teaching, they'll also help you see what the difference is between a Bible study and a sermon. They'll help you understand because it is a very different dynamic and they'll help you understand. And here the key is to be effective in your communication. Once you have the correct action in places of worship, in place of worship, where the real effort comes in is keeping your heart and mind focused on what you are doing. Worship in spirit takes real work, real effort. It takes mental and physical preparation. Now, Dave Miller wrote a book called Piloting the Strait, and he deals extensively with the idea of sometimes where people have gone off the rails and gets us back to keep the main thing the main thing. Unfortunately, the current climate in the church tends to treat worship as a time for entertaining the worshipper and catering to the worshippers wants. Consequently, worshippers have lost that deep reverent mindset, mindset that approaches the worship assembly with a sense of respect and cautious intention to please God. The worship is a revealed worship. It is sincerity is not enough. You can be sincere, but you can be sincerely wrong. Okay? You can be sincere, but you can be sincerely unbiblical. This is not your mother's backyard. This is not your sandbox. This is a holy place where God's rule stands. He determines how this thing's going to work. Let me just touch on something else from a marriage kind of perspective very quickly. I deal with marriages all the time. And so often you find that the husband actually gets it wrong. He assumes that his wife likes what he's doing. And he says, yes, but I like that, if you know what I mean. You know, here's the key. Find out what pleases God and say, Lord, I want to do that. Sincerity is not enough. Ignorant worship, we know that in Romans chapter 8, 9, and 10. He speaks of the ignorance of, of, of God's people, the Jewish people, the Israelites. Primary purpose is to worship and honor God. When we worship, we also build ourselves up. Can I shock you quickly? Have you ever felt like not going to worship? Come on, let's be honest. Okay? I'm being dead honest with you. And I'll tell you why. Man, you are exhausted. You've had a week from a different planet. And all you want to do is just lie in a bit. Am I right? I mean, Jared here is studying. He just finished his, he's on his honors degree now. Finished your honors? You're on your honors now? And you watch this young man, he works hard. But here's the key. He knows his place is in worship on a Sunday morning. Can I say this to you, brethren? When my son died, the next morning I was in worship. I sat at the back. I cried most of that service. Can I tell you why? I felt I didn't want to be here. I felt I wanted to mourn. I wanted to cry. But this I can tell you is that while I was sitting there and I looked at all these loving faces, at the worship, as I was served by men who loves God, I walked away 10 feet tall and bulletproof. Because it reaffirmed to me where my son is at the feet of Jesus. 
His worship is no longer something that is a concept. It is something that is real. It is something that he now lives around the throne of God. I walked away less wounded. I walked away less tired. I walked away inspired. You see, that's what God's word does for us. And so, so often we feel we need to withdraw when we are tired. Sunday morning's worship time, the day of the Lord, is not the day for that. And that is why, you know, sometimes people say, yeah, um, it's about attendance. It's, here's the key. Don't you dare minimize worship to what I'm going to say or what the elders are going to say. You watch and worry about where God wants you to be with his people. It, 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 it cements the values. It reminds you of who you are and whose you are and why you are and where you're going. It reminds you of just how important you are in the mind of God because Christ gave all so that you and I and the empty cross tells you that he was raised again so that we can live a new life. The event of worship is far deeper than just let me get through this hour so that I can get on with my day. If that's how you approach things, and us that are serving, we must never let that become an even remotely where people sit here and say, I might as well have been at home. Where people said, oh, I'm glad I'm here. God has spoken to my heart. God has truly touched my heart. I'm going to single out one man in this congregation. Joran Sloan. Did you know that this man writes out his prayers? Can I tell you something else about him? And I hope he doesn't mind. He actually does not like public speaking. Did you know that? He literally shivers in his boots. But every time that young man gets up and, and prays, I can tell you now, it's a prepared man because he's praying to an awesome God that has his full focus, that has his full reverence. And for that, I sit and I look at him and I say, Lord, that's what you desire. And I thank God because I can connect with him I can enjoy, I can respect, because he respects worshiping God and praying God. Every aspect is important. It must demonstrate reverence to God. It must reflect his revealed will. And where confusion exists and self-control doesn't, God is not being worshipped. God is a God of order. He's not of this kind of, in Afrikaans they say, wanneer a kerk in vervoering raak, en weggedra en weggesleer word dier die moosie. Dis nie aanbidding nie. God must be worshipped in spirit and in truth. Brethren, I'm going to leave it right there, but I want to touch on a few things. Ruan asked about devotionals. Worship structure, as you know, very quickly, is primarily the idea of how do we structure a worship that it is orderly. Remember when we spoke about that last point, about um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, 33. God is a God of order. And the idea here is that God is a God of structure. Now, I know congregations and I've served in those congregations where you have a sermon first. And right after the sermon, the preacher facilitates the Lord's Supper. And so the sequence sometimes will be different. Does that make sense? But the point is you need to reach the high points of praying, of preaching, of having the Lord's Supper, of giving. All of those elements must be in your worship. And the key behind it is, is that there must be structure and orderliness. This is not a make up as you go along kind of vibe. Spontaneity you use when you're sitting and playing with your child out at the park. 
thing be spontaneous. Here we are prepared because we are a family that lives in an orderly environment. It brings disorder out of this world where we exist, where we work hard, where we function, and God brings order. I was looking at a few Hebrew terms about the, the disorderliness of the creation and when God brought order into the creation and how we put specific elements into the creation to bring order and fruitfulness into the creation. And I tell you, I got goose goosefleisch. Because I think more and more we start to understand who God is. Devotionals I do every single morning. How do I do it? Can I just say, yeah, brethren, and, it's, and I can say this from my heart. It is the fruit of daily being in the word of God. Daily. My wife and I, we both get up in the morning at 5.30. Or probably at 5 o'clock we're awake already. Both of us always go together into the lounge. She takes out her Bible and she reads. My wife works differently. I work very differently. She reads the Bible and she reads it through sometimes twice to three times a year that she reads the Bible. And then as she goes on, she will say to me, Derek, tell me, have you ever read this? And more than likely I say, I have, but what strikes you about that? So she'll say, well, this and that, I've never seen this before, and it really means so much to me. And then we will talk about it. We talk about it as a husband and wife, and then we pray together. At night time, we do the same. This morning, we pray together at five, I think it was five o'clock, because I was awake at about half past four. I woke up and my wife and I, we were talking and we were just talking about the day yesterday and the day before's happenings with Ruan and Victoria and the children. And I said to her, I'm so sorry that you were so worried about it. And we, then we prayed about it. And those moments, brethren, I want to encourage you. When you're with your wife in bed, pray with her. There's a man in this audience that I love and he's the elder of this congregation, Don Crystal. Don gets up every morning and he prays next to his bed. His wife is not here anymore. She went on to be with the Lord. But his commitment to the Lord and his sincerity in his commitment to God has never dwindled. Every morning, as is his practice, he gets up, prays next to his bed and asks God to bless him and to give him the wisdom to lead and guide and be a shepherd to God's holy people. You see, brethren, devotional is not something that you pick up from a devotional book. Let me say, the other day I spoke about baptism and so on. And a lady that listens to it, Annette Day, let me tell you about her. She's out in Port Owen. She was a member of this congregation. She never misses a single service because she used to go to the Friedenberg Church and I think she still occasionally visits there. But she wrote to me and she says, Derek, I don't want to criticize your lessons or the devotional, but, but can I maybe mention to you that inside of this, I want to just suggest to you that you maybe explain what baptism is and what it's not. And the very next, the very day, I sat down and penned in my notebook. If you look at my cell phone, you will see that my cell phone has, and yours too, has got a segment for notes. And in there, my notes are packed and it's full. Full, full, full. There's notes in here that I write every single day. The other day, brethren, and I'm not, and I'm mentioning this, people will say to me, remember with Easter, and I'm just mentioning this very briefly, the reason I wrote about Easter eggs and that stuff is because sometimes we convolute Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection with the fun of an Easter egg hunt and pickle fish. The reason I wrote that is because six people wrote back to me. And I purposely wrote that. And one particular person who was a Roman Catholic wrote, and another person that's a Presbyterian. And they said to me, I am so glad you mentioned that. And that gave me an opportunity to speak and say, that is why in the church... We don't do that. It's about Jesus. We never detract from him. 
Bryn, can I just say this to us? Your devotional life and your omgaan met die woord van die Heere is jou verantwoordelijkheid. I've never seen a preacher at a loss for words when he has a prepared man and he reads his Bible every single day. That is your responsibility. And if you feel sometimes that you feel inadequate, don't try to withdraw from serving. Rather up your game. Does that make sense? Meet the challenge and say, you know what? I'm going to work harder at my spirituality. Get a brother that is experienced. Call a Josiah and say, Josiah, I want to have a cup of coffee with you. And I want you to help me. I want to preach one day, but I am so scared. I've got this message burning in my heart, but I don't know how to put it together. And I guarantee you, he would be more than willing to experience and work it through with you. Can I just say this to you? There's not one preacher that I know of that preaches on a Sunday morning and he's not shivering in his boots. Why? Because he knows with whom he is dealing with. He knows that he will be held accountable. He knows that he will be judged with a greater, 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 more accuracy. And hence the responsibility is so much greater.